talk um, about moving forward and this idea that the word resilience is something that we, we toss this word around. Um, academics like to use the word resilience and how we're preparing for it a lot. But, um, you know, there might be a better word than resilience when we actually think about on the ground um, measures that we are taking to be these healthy, thriving communities that we really want to see. And when you think about how um, extreme storms, um, extreme events, and disastrous uh, wildfires kind of are, are coming up against our goals for larger, resilient um, communities, then, then you know, our leaders here are going to talk about that today. So thank you. I'm going to kind of start out um, with, with each of you. Um, maybe just saying a few words. We all know you're here, but for um, our recordings online, you could just give a couple of uh, introductory statements about your uh, history in the area. So, you start you, asking? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so, Woody, Woody Pine, I'm a District 3 supervisor right now for Gila County. I uh, was born here in Globe, went to grade school here in Globe, been living between here and Young. Since then, currently, I'm in Young and have been for the last part of probably a number of years. And so straight out of high school, went to work for the Forest Service, worked with them till 2005 when I got out of the Forest Service. I was there for no one because of that, so that's me. Just learned something new. I did not know you worked for the Forest Service. Um, Todd, let me see your um, the town manager for Town of Superior. I've been there for about five years now. I was on the fire department for about 13, 14 years before that. Well, that's it. I'm short and sweet. <laughs> Mayor Chris. Al Gamero, so Mayor of City of Globe on my second term, uh, five years in now. Um, I retired uh, from the fire department in Globe. I was there 30 years and 18 years as a fire chief there. Um, I was born and raised in Globe in Miami and uh, so really care about this community. Uh, Sammy Gonzalez, uh, Mayor for the town of Miami. Uh, lifeline, lifelong resident. Born and raised in Miami, never left. Uh, been uh, mayor for about a year and a half now and been on council for about 10, 11 years, someplace around there. I lost track. Um, and I am an educator in Miami High School, um, school district. Thanks. And so, starting with you, Mayor Gonzalez, with our first question. Um, how will our communities continue to not only survive, but thrive in the face of these kind of climate threats and fire? Um, and also, if you could give some examples of local policies or initiatives that, that you have in mind um, or would like to see enacted. Uh, man, there's a, multiple questions there. I have two, two parts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, our community, like you said, is they're very resilient. And, uh, you know, with all the events that have happened, you, you know, the community has known what we've gone through and what we went through. And it's because of a small community, I believe, and, and everybody watches everybody's backs and everybody has, um, they, they lend a hand when needed. And so I think in the future, if any other catastrophes or uh, pandemics or any kind of issues that come through, that it will be uh, the same because of the resiliency that we have. Uh, we do have a lot of policies uh, in place uh, working in the future uh, for future uh, possibly flooding. A lot of mitigations, uh, you know, we just, ADOT just finished their work across uh, where we're at right now on ADOT Bridge. Uh, to prevent any kind of future. And so uh, the county and maybe uh, Mr. Klein will probably uh, talk about this a little bit. Uh, they just received $8 million uh, to help uh, mitigate for future um, problems. So there's a lot of projects. Uh, we do have probably about, I think we're gonna probably take about $200,000 worth of it and clean out Miami Wash uh, all the way down to uh, Bounder Park. And so, you know, we do projects and, and in place to kind of prevent some of these issues to arise. And um, just a quick follow up to that, did ADOT um, has helped like identify bridges and structures at risk and you're working actively with them, has that been a smooth process? So ADOT is on, only has this bridge that they're responsible in our town limits. Uh, we do have on um, Sullivan Street our bridges and we did get a structural engineer that came out and inspected and um, all the bridges are still uh, working conditions with no issues from the flooding. 
So do any of our other panel members want to follow up with um, their thoughts on policies or for the future? Yeah, I'll follow up a little bit on that. Also, we we need to learn from our, uh, you know, how it went in these last events with uh, with the fires and the flooding. I think this is something we're going to need to plan for for the next two, three, five years, depending because we're going to have this flooding going on, and we still have the potential for fire. So as we move forward, we really need to put it in our um, action strategic action plans for the future and come up with potential funding to help us do that. And a lot of that's going to be through lobbying through the state. They're going to have to come up with funding to help us out. We can't do it. We aren't able to do that. I think what we saw was, uh, I know in, in our city that we're going to, we have to re re review and update our emergency operations plan because I think that's important. I don't think that's been updated since shortly after 9-11 where we had, uh, we even had our own emergency operations center in the city of Globe. Even though the county had theirs, we had ours, but we were able to collect the data, the information, and get it to the people. I think the frustrating part of this, what we saw was people were frustrated. They wanted answers right away, and it's hard to give, get those answers, you know, especially when people have different modes of communication, whether it's social media, radio, uh, whatever it is. But we need to be able to do a better job of communicating with these people. And I think for the future, and I've had a conversation with uh, Mr. Bromley, we need to become a Firewise Community Designation. Because we need to, just like this meeting, I wish we had had more of the community that uh, was aware. We saw some great presentations yesterday. We saw some today of uh, growth and why things are happening. And the community needs to be educated. And, and so we can prepare ourselves for the future uh, to, to decrease the amount of damage. Yes. Yeah. So with that and what the mayor says is absolutely correct. And, and so what we've seen in, in the past Especially on the on the uh, side of the the drainages, the washes, the canyons. They're, they're, over all these years, there's been a huge buildup in these washes. A lot of it has been because of policy, not necessarily from the town or whatever. It could have been from the state, where ADQ or whoever it was wouldn't allow you into those drainages to clean them out and keep them cleaned out. That has changed, and so. With the events that's been going on, it opened a lot of eyes. And so with the money, like the mayor brought up, the $8 million, and, and that's that's where it's targeted. That's what it's targeted to do, is to go in these drainages and, and muck them out and clean them up and get them back to where maybe they originally were at one time so that they will allow that water to run instead of just build them back up. You know, right now with the state of these draws, with the silt and, and the buildup in them, it holds that water back. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons why we have the issues we did. So we're hoping to get in there and um, really clean those out and help that. Um, what Mayor Gameros was saying about the future is, is 100%. Thank God the state came out with that $100 million. Had they not have done that, we'd have been in a world of hurt right now. I don't really, I don't know what we would have been doing. Uh, but with that money, that has allowed us to try and, and uh, tackle these issues. One of the things that I believe, and mayors, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's been a, quite a few years since we've had this extensive flooding problems. We've got a lot of folks that live down pretty close to these drainages, basically, right up out of the banks. But they haven't seen this kind of flooding in a lot of years. I do, I say that the fires is what caused this, you know, by burning off that vegetation, there's nothing out there to hold it, so it all comes off. But back in the day, a long time ago, when I was a kid, we used to have some flooding here just naturally from the winters, the springs and whatever. But it's been a long time, we haven't seen that. And so the mayor's right, a lot of people were frustrated because water's running through their buildings or, or around them and they're wanting something done right now. And, and that's very, very tough. We, we put our crews out there, we do what we can, but it's, it's really tough. So right now, going forward, what I see is a chance to look back and learn from all this and really focus on the areas, <clears throat> the future problems that, that we're gonna have because the mayors are correct. This isn't over. We still got another couple of years, I would say at least until this kind of stuff's backing off. And so, so policy-wise, um, I think some attitudes and some things have changed as far as the drainage mitigations go. Uh, I think that's going to be a big help. 
and from a county working with the cities. <clears throat> I think we need to stay in there and, and be a partner in all three of us and whoever else. I mean, this we got a lot more coming to us, I'm sure, in the future, but but we need to band together, work all these these issues out, and keep them keep them going. Thank you. Thanks. And um, Todd, as town manager, you have about, I don't know, a thousand hats that you wear um, day to day. And you're also outside of Gila County. Um, can you give a little perspective from, from Tom Spear? Sure. Um, there are, uh, for, for the problems from the Telegraph Fire are essentially in two buckets. You have the fire impacts and you have the flooding impacts. Flooding impacts, um, the, the part of the issue has been we've been in 20 years of drought. We also have communities that go into wash areas and build our downtowns right adjacent to washes. So we have concentrated those flows into, into very small areas where it used to open out into floodplain areas and, and the, the, the flow would slow, slow down or it would get into canyon areas and speed up. All those, are, those natural systems are changed. So now that we're getting uh, higher flows that, uh, that we haven't seen for the last 20 years, all of those, those flood conditions are being accentuated. So the, um, you know, our, like, our community is, is addressing that through looking for ways to open up um, areas where people have added berms to try to concentrate the flow and speed it up, uh, to allow uh, areas for the, for the flow to spread out and slow down. Um, but those, the floodplain laws, um, they, they, they have a lot of restrictions and a lot of, of property issues. So when you start getting into what, what's allowed in the floodplain, what, what we can, you know, where the funding is to address those issues, it gets very complex. And we need somebody like Ashley to come and tell us how to, to access that and how to plan for that. So um, that, that's the, the, the floodplain um, bucket. And it hasn't affected Superior the way it has affected these upper areas. There's a lot, the watersheds are much larger here. There's, when the fire hits them, um, they, the flows are much higher, and so it's very concentrated through, through Globe and Miami. So they're going to have a much uh, greater problem uh, with this new calculus. But uh, none of these washes are sufficient. None of the, the, the old designs are going to work. So we're not just going to have to repair what's there. We're going to have to come up with new treatment methods to, to deal with the flood. And that's going to take government support beyond $100 million allotment. It's going to take yearly regular maintenance on these washes and a, um, a, a straight funding source to help get those things done. From the fire side, patterns have changed. Superior used to be, when, did, when we did our Pinal County Wildland Urban Interface Plan when I was in the fire department a good decade ago, Superior was had more fire starts than anywhere else. I don't know why, um, it, but uh, if you start putting a little fire triangle on every named fire over at the town of Superior for the last 40 years, you can't see the town. So they used to be small fires. It'd be a hundred acre fire, worst case, 2000 acre fire. Now those fires are turning into hundred thousand acre fires that come up and affect Globe, Miami. Those are the, that model has been the, the model that has been most damaging for our communities over the last you know, few years. We don't have a perception on any level beyond our local level that the Sonoran Desert is a fire problem. And the deceive, that the, the Tano National Forest where it meets the Sonoran Desert is a forest. Everybody thinks forest means big trees, means flagstaff. There's lots of treatment plans. There's lots of consensus around getting us money to do things about that. But um, when you start talking about, you know, I needed to go in and cut a hundred acres of mesquite scrub, People will say, well, that's, you know, that's not the forest and that's not, you know, the, the mesquite is probably native and it shouldn't be a problem. And why are we doing that anyway? And so we have to build because of our microecologies, our, our little micro ecosystems that, that are in the transition between the high and low desert, low Miami, we're, we're like other places, but we're also unique. So building a consensus around what fuels treatments looks like and what um, and what we should be doing to protect against fire isn't going to get larger reach than our local area. So we have to be united in taking that up to the to the Fed, Fed and the state and say, look, for this area, this is what we need to do to protect our, our community. And um, the, when you start looking for forestry management, 
go go look on YouTube and put forestry management. In. You'll see 50 videos about what to do about tall pines. There's nothing about what to do if about Sonoran Desert. So we're going to have to kind of develop our own treatment methods and for a completely new condition, a completely, uh, you know, uh, the fire spread is so much greater, so much faster. We have put in, we put together a coalition when this first happened because the $100 million does not include money for fire prevention. It's just mitigation of the past impacts of the telegraph fire. So we put together a coalition. We have a plan to do fire breaks around all of our communities. We've worked with you know, everybody in this room pretty much to discuss this issue. Superior has put out three grants so far. The first two have been turned down. Um, I, it, I think it is a perception issue by the people up higher. And there's also a certain lack of ability on our level to be able to produce documents that other people will see and understand. And is our forestry, you know, are we protecting the, the sequoias? No, we don't have that emotional stuff. Do we have the eco ecological, uh, we're protecting this bunny rabbit. Um, we don't have that argument. Not every forestry management project is sexy. Not every forestry pro pro uh, management project has a triple bottom line for the, for, um, for the the ecosystem and for everything else. Some things just need to be done because it's a safety issue. But unless we can show positive reuse of our of our wood products, unless we can show that um, that uh, that we're not damaging the bunny rabbit, we aren't going to get funded. So there also needs to be systems where there's an, a certain assumption that in the wildland urban interface that money needs to be spent out for just that development of safe space. And it has to be done not just on, this plan we put together includes four different mines, it includes counties, it includes uh, towns, it includes Fed, BLM, and forestry. So what's the, the path to get all of those things approved? Where's the plan that we can show each of those agencies that this is our plan for our region and how we're gonna address it? Yeah, and that's, that's actually a great, I think, segue into the next question and how we are taking these steps right now, taking a disaster as an opportunity to hit on like, I don't know, 10 of the things that you covered a lot there. So, so some of these um, changes that need to be addressed in terms of the technical assistance, we're in a Sonoran desert environment and a lot of people don't view that as the same as, as pine and it's not as much understanding about how to treat a fire adapted system. Um, the, the floodways and working with state and federal um, agencies to be able to define floodplains and how your communities, which is something that all of us have in common, right? Our communities coming up uh, straight into the drainage, um, against the drainage, I mean. And, and then these also um, attitudes about uh, what, what mitigation means. So on that note, um, maybe, well, anyone <laughs> who wants to speak on this, um, how do we maintain momentum and, and work on not just recovery, but mitigation? I can jump yes. in. Uh, so I think we have to rely on a lot, for one, a lot of resources. And we know, uh, kind of like what Mayor Maros was stating earlier about, you know, we're in this for probably three to five years of the flooding. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at ways that we have to uh, recover from that. And um, some of the ways we could probably look at is, you know, getting with Forest Service and uh, looking at maybe uh, assisting in any way or asking for assistance on receding uh, some of those areas that, that to get growth back. Um, I know that the federal government is pretty tied up with a lot of funds, but you know, like they said earlier, like Mayor Merrill said earlier, looking for help and any kind of assistance to help in that. And then, as the town manager from Superior stated earlier, um, looking at fire breaks. You know, in the Pinellas, I mean, I know it's difficult and I know it's tough, but in our region and our area, I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns is, you know, to prevent any of that encroachment into our communities. And so having, you know, there is no fire breaks. And so that's a big, um, to work on possibly and get some funding for that. 
Yeah, I'm taking curious <laughs> little notes on the margins. I don't have enough space. Because I really hope that we can, this is the small group, right? This is that Mark and Johnny talked about, that we want to be able to go after this meeting and take you up on these suggestions. So um, when you're saying seeding and assistance from Forest Service, the county is also doing work. And Mayor Damaris, I'm going to come back to you, but I was wondering if Supervisor Klein could speak to the reseeding efforts. Yeah, I can um, real quick, and then I'd like to talk about the other two. So, <clears throat> so back in time, the Forest Service had what was called a bear team, and Adam, they don't have that. It's not called that anymore. It's called something else, but I'm old, so i got to go back to what it was called. But anyway, the bear teams would roll in after an incident. After a fire hit, the bear teams would come in. They'd do their assessments, and with the bear team came money for mitigation, and rehab projects on the incidents. That meant that they would do the seating projects. That meant that they would, you know, tend to the roads. They'd go back and cover up fire lines and, and, and fire breaks that were built to stop the fires. And they, they would do all these different things with, um, with a different pot of money, basically, than suppression. And that has changed. And so now when it comes to efforts as far as getting the infrastructure back going again, seating, whatever it is, roads, things like that, the district rangers, the line officers will apply for other other monies and may or may not get them. You know, it, it's a crapshoot. Or they may get a portion of it. And which goes back into whether it's fence lines, water tanks, roads, pipelines, um, all these different things. The one thing everybody needs to keep in mind is in the last 12 years, NRCS has put millions of dollars on the ground on public lands, on these permits. And so when you have these big incidents, you're losing miles of pipelines, you're losing miles of fences and all that. So the line officers try and get some money back to, that'll come back in and replace these. Sometimes they get some money, sometimes they get partial money, sometimes they don't get any money. So then, <laughs> What happened, what has been happening in the five years I've been a supervisor is when the Forest Service gets done, they, they leave and then the county ends up working with the line officers and whoever's left behind to try and mitigate a lot of these issues. And the county does not have the funds to go in there and spend several million dollars on an incident to, to put it back together. We don't have it. And so we start looking for grant monies and everything like that. Reseeding projects uh, or efforts is a real good, quick way to get things back to stabilize the soil. Because like you guys have seen, when those incidents come through and you got the Pinal sitting here above you, you get all that erosion. All that water comes off, it washes everything down, it comes through and plugs up our washes, it ends up in the lake eventually. But if you can get in back in there and do some kind of mitigation that'll help hold that soils in place, it isn't going to be as bad, but you're looking at a year for it to really get established. So you kind of got to start pretty quick. So the county this year, what happened was, is we took over an admin site in Young. Well, right down that admin site, there was a seed storage shed there. And in the past, we had seed harvesting projects up there that Game and Fish partnered with us on. And we had a harvester, and I'd put some people on it in the fall of the year in October and harvest seeds, native seeds. A lot of those seeds were still there. And then also they had a, quite an accumulation of seeds from the Rodeo Chess Sky Fire that was still in that building. So I got with the line officer in Pace and Matt Pachorik and he said, yeah, use it, take it. So we brought all that down. We uh, got to talking around. The U of A, I think, is working with uh, El Capitan as well on some things. Uh, so we, a lady from Tucson, Kathy, is that where she's from? Angie? I think she's actually from She's in Okay. Anyway, it's Arizona Community Foundation had gotten a hold of us and said they had a little handful of money and how could they help? So we told them about the seed, seeding projects and how we'd like to, to build on that and make it better. They donated about $20,000 and then the Wildland Restoration Outfit in Tucson put the package together and those seeds are going to El Capitan now. And so there's, I don't know, six, 700 pounds of seed that's gonna go in there. Not enough. I'd like to see a whole lot more, but it's a start, you know? And so I think 
it's all about money. That's what it's all about. Seeds don't come cheap. And these incidents, when they burn 15, 20,000 acres in a whack, it's a lot of, lot of area to cover. And so it, it really goes back to the fact who's going to pay the cost to try and put these, these areas back whole again, as close as you can get it. You know, and there's some there's some benefits out of this too as well. I was talking to Adam about earlier when when you burn those those chaparral fields, the last thing you want to do is leave them alone and let them re-sprout and grow back, and you'll look like Southern California in another four or five years, and it has the opportunity to burn again. So you know, like talking to the folks in El Capitan, it's like you guys really you know as bad as this was, you have a, a benefit here to look at your your ground. Look at your area that's that's moonscaped and figure out how you want to go back and design this to, to keep it that way, to break up that composition of fuels, to keep it from building back up and making another run through your communities. So so there's a lot there, but ultimately it comes down to money and, and it takes a lot of money to put things back together after these incidents are done. And like I said, this is the fifth fifth incident we've had since I've been in office. Big incidents. So. Mm -hmm. And Mary Lotta, who is the fire ecologist that spoke yesterday, would be so happy to talk about mosaic landscape and how important that is. So, fire ecology isn't something that's new. It's been around a long time. Um, back in the day, we actually went through and did a lot of tree ring surveys. So in the upper elevations, you know, but that gave us the history we needed on the fire ecology. One thing that we learned, which would be the upper end of Gila County, all across the rim, Gila County, County is second to Florida in lightning occurrence strikes. So the, the history of fire in, in the pine type is quite frequent. It showed a lot of fire and low intensities, which made sense because back in the day, back then, Smokey the bear wasn't around to put these fires out. And so the fires were allowed to creep around and burn and do their things, which they cleaned up a lot of that, those fuels that were on the ground and killed back and burned back a lot of that regrowth that was trying to grow. So your stands were running about 30 stems per acre, which is like a park, which is really cool. The Sonoran Desert, and I, we just had this discussion the other day in, in AJ, it was a really good discussion, you know, and everybody has the same concerns. What do we do to save the Sonoran Desert? How do we protect our backyards that are backed up against the Sonoran Desert? <clears throat> Doing treatments in the Sonoran Desert is tricky because if you go in there and you disturb that ground and you do some things and you have a good winter, your grass grows back really, really well. From a permittee standpoint, we like seeing that. That's, that's good. But from a fire standpoint, that's not so good. So you got to kind of balance that out, you know, and and figure how you can do like like your fuel brakes. You can put your fuel brakes in, in position. You can treat them however you think it's going to work, but you got to think about the rest of it too. Sonoran deserts, if there's no fuel, it doesn't burn. That's all there is to it. In the chaparral type, veg type, it's going to burn. If you've got the ignition source and you've got the heat, and especially after the drought when your live fuel moistures are zeroed out, it's going to burn. It's going to be really hard to, to handle. So Northern Desert's a little bit different. And so that was a big discussion. And, and to come up with a strategy to do fuel breaks wasn't hard. What was hard was how do you keep that going and keep the rest of it going? You know, the swirls are standing all over there around Superior and, uh, Gold Canyon and AJ, people like saguaros. You know, you look at the beeline, drive out the beeline, head to Payson, and see how many live saguaros are left there. Not a lot of them. They're just, just burnt candles. So, so that's a bigger discussion, but, um, but there's a lot of work. But reseeding is, 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 a, is a huge plus, especially for stabilizing the soils. It really helps. And so we're, we're committed to try and do that. I've also been in conversation with Game and Fish to try and maybe put together a, a seed harvesting program for native seeds, which will be tough. Actually, I'd rely on you a lot for that because we don't want to harvest the wrong seeds. So, you know, so that's something we're, I'm kind of looking at as well, but, uh, but it all comes down to money. 
Thank you to Professor Klein, and um, I wanted to pass it to Mary Gomeros, and we've covered a lot of ground between already in this panel. Um, and so I wanted to, to throw it back to you if you wanted to respond to any of these comments, but also get back to this idea of momentum and opportunities to address intervention uh, and as we also do recovery. Yeah, I agree with the Supervisor Klein. You know, it, it's going to take a cooperation, cooperation between the town of Miami, Gila County, and the expertise of the Forest Service in our community, because ours is different than what Superior is and how we move forward. Um, it was interesting to hear the Bear team yesterday when they talked about the, their assessment of the roads and the ground and, st ground and stuff like that. But the funding really isn't there to to actually do mitigation to 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 make things come back. I mean, it's they talked about mulching at seven hundred dollars an acre, and it really wasn't uh, feasible with the amount of uh, acreage that needed to be mulched. So and with little with little uh, success, uh, but I think it's important that we need to continue as a government to continue to solicit the the state. We need funding. They can't continue to cut forestry and other programs in, in the situation we're in right now. So it's going to take us to to really move forward to uh, to get that funding every year. We need you know we, it's there. The burn scar is there. The rain is here. We got to be able to have the funding to keep the waterways smooth, moving uh, smoothly, and somehow put some barriers that protect some areas. We've seen water flow in the this year that I've ever seen, and I've lived here my whole life. I've never seen water flow where it has. And I see they're doing some mitigation by Kaiser. They're putting up some engineer walls there, mm -hmm. and and that's to protect. We have the railroad. We got to protect also that runs through our through our community. So. And, and again, you're right, Supervisor, it takes money. We gotta have the money. The state needs to allocate money to our communities so we can manage it for the future. Keith, are you taking notes, Keith? <laughs> 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 yeah. Congressman in Hallorin's office. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that after this panel we can kind of keep these conversations going. There's a lot of such specific ideas that- Actually, uh, can I add one more real quick thing here? It's kind of tough to even mind too, but we can talk about projects all day long, especially on the, on the public land side, on national forestry. But Keith, until that t and &E Species Act is, is dealt with, projects are hard, you know? And, and I, I'm gonna just give you, I'm not gonna dwell on this very long because I could spend the rest of the day on it. But when you take the Pinellas, there's probably an X amount of number of alpacs in the Pinellas. So when these guys want to go do a treatment in the canals, they got to do certain standards inside those alpacs. Save the nest tree, you know, be specific on what they're going to take on and on and on. It's really kind of pretty much ties their hands behind their back. That needs to be addressed going forward. And I'll give you another example. The Muggy on Rim on the Pleasant Valley District alone, we had 28 alpacs on the face of that rim. It made it so impossible, we couldn't do any treatments on that rim. We, we couldn't do it. We couldn't get through the, the NEPA process and the TNE species of Fish and Wildlife Service in order to pull those projects off. And so what do you do? You sit there and wait until a rodeo chest guy fire comes through there and it burns it all up. The rangers submit a take on the packs and you go on with life. And that's not the way the system is designed. But it needs to be changed so that these guys have the opportunity to to do these projects. So if it's a fuel break on the panels or wherever it may be, so Good just wanted to add that. So I wanted to. So we're talking about coordination. We're talking about the funds necessary. Um, and I think you all have a pretty good idea of, we've already talked about what kind of results you'd like to see. Is there anything you'd like to add in terms of uh, whether it be kind of the culture changes, working with communities, increased coordination? Uh, the, the, our region has had some recent success in coalition grants, um, and the county took lead on the recent uh, EPA grant. This is an excellent opportunity for us to, to look for a regional grant source um, USDA is a good example. They have a separate, outside of the forestry, through rural development, they have a reseeding grant for communities to apply for reseeding uh, money. Uh, if we did a coalition grant and set up some procedures and some, you know, some stockpiles of seed and, and stuff under that grant, we could do it as our region. Because 
like I said previously, our region is unique. Uh, we're unlike others. We're, we're Superior isn't just Sonoran Desert. It's transition from Sonoran Desert to the Chaparral. So we have both fuel types. So we're kind of an oddball, which is why we burn so much. Um, that's true of our entire region. We're, we're kind of unique. So working as a region makes a lot of sense for us, especially since one thing affects us all. But we've got the, the receding. We've got the fuel breaks and fire breaks that we could be doing as a region. All of these things start with the unsexy stuff of the planning process. We need a, a plan we can take and present to these, these grant underwriters showing them that we've thought this out. So we need to start working together, uh, same way, way we did on Blight, to sit down and develop a plan and to have a communication um, strategy around getting people understanding our plan so we can get it funded. Thank you. And that's that's a part of this question, right? The, the regional approach to communication and messaging. Um, you know, I'm kind of looking over to, to Mayor Gonzalez. Do you have anything you would add to that or what you would like as a small town to focus on? So as a small town, you know, Miami had learned, they learned a lot. We learned a lot uh, going through this. And uh, in the process, you know, we, we have to work, like Mayor Gamero uh, stated earlier, we have to work on our emergency uh, plan, uh, update it. Uh, our plan has been probably back in 1970, and so things have not changed. And so we have to work, so what we learned on this is to update that. Uh, you know, the evacuation process that we had, 60% of our community in town of Miami was evacuated because of the fire, and there was a little bit of chaos on that. And so working with our emergency plan and trying to make it better, safer, safer for our citizens, uh, like I said, uh, is benefit for us because what took place, we can learn from it and um, help our citizens out. Yeah, and quick follow-up to that. Uh, I mean, going about updating the emergency operations plan for both Globe and Miami, do you have like funds? Like, is this something that the you know, we should be going out after this and I'm trying to seek funding to help out with that? Is there a, kind of like a, a way that some people here today could provide assistance with, with getting you, that one? You know, after 9-11, there was uh, some funds that, that did help, especially with the fire service and, and, and emergency operation plan. And that's where we receive funding to upgrade our, our plan, mm -hmm. plus develop our own EOC, because you have to have you know, we had uh, cabinets, we had phones, we had everything in place that if, if something did happen, we just put it there and we had a place to, to all congregate and have our incident command post there uh, to be able to get the, the players in the same room so we could be sharing the same information. So back then there was funding, but that was after 9-11, then everybody forgets about what happened in 9-11, and now we have floods and fires that uh, we're gonna need to get funding for. So we'll take up some funding sources, yeah, that's yeah. something we can do. Anything else to add to that, Mayor no, uh, I think we hit it. There's always, you know, need for any resources, especially in town of Miami, you know, being so small, we always look for resources to help accommodate what we need to implement in our policies and procedures. So, Supervisor Klein, anything to add on um, what these things are I, These guys are right on track. The only thing I would add is that message to the public. And I think you ought to tailor it more like your smoking bear message over the last hundred years. That was a very successful message that we all grew up with. But you need a message out there that doesn't that doesn't shoot down that prescribed fire in these projects. You need a message out there that really promotes these projects and 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 will bring awareness to everybody that hey this this is a good thing. You might see some smoke in the air. You might be impacted by it for a few days, you know, or you may be impacted by a little bit of traffic going around your place, doing some field breaks, whatever it is. But these are good things. And I think that message right now the time is right for a message like that after what we've seen this summer. So, One thing um, I noted when Mark was talking was how they got two houses to sign up for Firewise and then other houses in the neighborhood wanted to follow along because they saw how it cleaned it up and it was a great you know, funding source. And so, you know, how, how do we do that? Let's focus the two homeowners and, and get it started. Yeah. Public relations. <laughs> Um, okay, well, so in our last few minutes, I want to spend time, um, you know, speaking of communication and getting out to the public, what would you want to convey? Either something you've heard already in this meeting or your own message to your constituents, to your community. I guess I can start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, you know, the county does have an emergency system, Everbridge, uh, and, you know, have our community, everybody in our surrounding areas to sign up for Everbridge. Don't wait for an emergency have it already implemented in place 
And so that's my message that I want to get out is just because we're in a non-emergency, sign up for every bridge and uh, get the word out to people. I'm going to text Carl Mumford and let him know you said that. Yeah, Carl did. Yeah, Carl did. <laughs> he's doing, he's doing, yeah, he's doing $5 bills to people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about uh, Mary Yeah, I like the way you started your uh, the meeting yesterday is uh, honest about honesty in your dialogue and your conversations. Because I say sometimes we're afraid to do that, I think, because we don't want to criticize our own. Um, you know, I, I think the gentleman that just said it on the video today, pointing fingers and the critics out there criticizing uh, or making accusations how the fire started, you know, and and, and also the strategy and the, the land that was burned. You know, they need to understand, I think it begins with education, they need to understand how strategy and, and firefighting takes out in, in the forestry. And they need to understand that firefighter safety is the most important thing. You know, we talked about, uh, I think it was Ms. Browler from ADQ, and she talked about maybe having access to earlier hotshot crews and stuff. But I think with the forestry, they don't get their hotshot crews till they have uh, the school, the, the school kids, right? So it's not really only summertime, but something that people don't realize, we, there's many departments that contract with the state land department. We have contracted in the city globe since 2001. And things changed when the granite hotshot crew was, was, was killed, 19 firefighters. Um, because there was there was suit lawsuits and and discussions about part time and full time. So once they determined some of these individuals were 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 part time were full time determined full time, it cost the city of Prescott lots of money because of the retirement system. So in Globe, we changed. We have a crew that we send out an engine we send out since two thousand one all over the north, the south, the southwest. But we changed now that we do not send any part time firefighters on our engine, which hurt us, which hurt our staffing, because we don't want to run into the same situation where we would have to compensate for full-time benefits. It, it's huge. It really is. And we have public safety retirement for our firefighters, police, and I don't know why the forestry isn't on it. I mean, they, they, they're in hazard duty. They have a different type of retirement system, but we need to understand that, that it, it, it's all about liability also out there because it is a dangerous profession. When we're putting these people out there. So I think it's about education and people understanding um, strategy, suppression, I mean, I mean the whole thing. And I think this is important. I wish we had more of the public. And I think these need to continue. And hopefully through this uh, organization, we can make that possible. Yeah, completely agree. And that's the goal. Um, Tommy, what's your card? Uh, 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 to to uh, Al's point previously, the, the one of the things that that has come out of the changes in the fire behavior and in that shift to professional firefighters is that there's less off duty, less gap filling um, uh, firefighting. It used to be the forestry would come to Superior and they would do a fire break or they would do a back burn just about every year. That stopped about a decade ago. Um, that off season uh, work has meant that we have more fire loading up against our communities today and higher heat. So we're more at risk than we were 10 years ago. So the um, one of the big uh, the, the dichotomies is here. So we've got the pro firefighters and they are, you know, Phoenix firefighter comes out, he makes $30 an hour in his regular day. He comes out on this fire, he's making $45 an hour. And we could pay a guy with a weed whacker to go around a year, you know, six months prior and cut all those weeds and give a defensible space. And we pay him 15 bucks an hour. Um, but we can get money for suppression. We can't get money for fire breaks. So that that break, that that investment for twenty million dollars to put out the telegraph fire, but no money available to spend one million dollars to do fire breaks to protect us from the next fire, needs to be addressed. So a couple of things, I, and I and I think we're at the time now we're addressing this is 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 the right time. There's, there's, there's different management strategies out there as far as fuel breaks and, and, and things like that. Grazing is one of them. Whether it's goats, cattle, horses, it doesn't matter. You know, for 15 bucks an hour, Todd, I'll put a hundred head down there. We'll be good. So, you know, so, so there, this, this is just, you got to take the blinders off. You really do. You got to really take the blinders off and, and every, every area is going to be different in some ways, and whether it's the vegetation type, whether it's the 
design of the, the town that you're trying to protect, the community you're trying to protect, or the physical features coming into it, but every every area is going to be different. That's why these line officers and, and these area directors, like the BLM or state, whoever it is, they have the manpower behind them or below them to put these projects together and work with the fire departments, work with the mayors and things like that to do it. One thing that is real critical too, we've always think that, that by putting these fuel breaks in, we're protecting these houses and these communities, and you are or you're at least giving them a place to make a stand to try and protect them. It's also the opposite. When you put in these, these field breaks around towns and towns and communities, you're protecting the force behind you. I don't know how many fires I've been on that came from somebody's backyard trash barrel. And, and after three days of running the door of the hill, you finally catch it. And so, so there's different ways, and, and that's why when you when you really settle into these groups and you start looking at things, you really have to open those blinders up and take a real strong look at it, and be a partner with with your with the folks, be a part of it. And that, and if it's one main message I would give everybody is to be involved. I mean, you we've got what do we got here between Miami and, and Globe, fifteen thousand or so people. Yeah. We all sat here for how long and watched this go on, and then we watched all the flooding afterwards. I would have thought this room would have been packed today, to be honest with you. I mean, really what we're talking to here, we're, we're preaching to the choir, we're preaching to you guys, a lot of you already know this, but, so it would be nice to have a lot of these people more involved than they are, because we get the questions. My people, my departments, they all get the questions. How are you gonna fix this? What are you gonna do there? Where, where, where are we going? Where are we going? But so my, my main message to everybody out there would be, be involved. That makes me think of the music events and all of the um, events where we need this message at those where the people are that, that didn't come today, but we got to get the, the message out more. The one thing too, and I'll back up what Al had to say too, uh, we don't need any more divisiveness. We don't need any division. We have an issue that we really need to work on and change. And, and I don't care what happened at the beginning of the fire or whatever else, but we have, we have to work on this and, and work on the ways going forward, not backwards. And, and I think that as leaders of the communities, I think we have that responsibility to keep that in check and, and keep it headed the right way. That's what I would say. Yeah, and I just had a yeah, comment following up on that. Yeah, I, I think it's keeping the politics out of uh, what is best for our communities is what is right. Todd is right. You know, that $100 million benefited all of us, but that was more reactive response from the government. You know, and when I when we talk about the Telegraph fire and when we had uh, a couple of uh, structures burned, I don't know if we had more than seven, and, and we had a big meeting at the fairgrounds where we had the governor here, the senators here, the representatives here, and they allocated $100,000 for two large tents for animals. You know, when we could have done with one, it was, it was $50,000 a week to put those uh, shelters up at the, at the high desert school. And then a week later, you go, we've had three floods in the Globe Miami area, and you go to the Four Star Mobile Home Park or Little Acres Mobile Home Park, you had 42 trailers that were damaged in that, in that uh, flood. And they had two outhouses, a stack of water, no way to shower, nothing. Nothing was allocated. Nobody came to this community to offer us assistance. And we had humans out there that were living in their cars, living in damaged trailers. That, that isn't right. You, that's what I'm saying. We need to keep the politics out. Was a telegraph fire a bigger event because it was a national event and these little floods were really not, not as uh, visible as they were. Uh, I want to make sure if there are any burning questions in the audience, we can get those answered. And um, I don't know, Mayor Gonzalez, do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay, no, sorry, no. I thought I heard it. Oh, yeah. But yeah, anyone in the audience? And so that state money. There is some ways through there they imply, and, and so we've been working on that with a lot of these folks. I, 
I hope that everybody's getting the message out there so they know where to go. But uh, we actually have contractors out there going around working with these landowners and the folks that's been burned out and impacted to apply for state money. It, it comes through us. We put it into the state. The Department of Forestry and Fire Management approves it. It's, it's, it's been a little hectic there, but, but I think we are getting, getting it back on the ground. I hope we are. I keep trying to keep up with it as best I can. And I, it seems to be working as far as I know. Just, just one, and, uh, and as far as funding, just real quick, there is funding that was a, a United uh, Fund of uh, Globe Miami uh, initiated a fundraiser and uh, raised money because that would go directly to the people that had uh, private property or their property damage that they could allocate. So it went to the United Fund, they went to the Salvation Army and th there was raised, I think, $300,000 in our community. And mainly due to the, the mines in our community, Freeport, McMoran, Capstone and BHP donated huge amounts of money to that. So that money is sitting there. So people need money for like sheetrock or, or, or uh, personal items or lost in the flood or the fire, they can apply to the Salvation Army. That's great. We had requests for that kind of information before, so I'm glad you addressed that. Uh, I saw a question in the back, and we'll just end it with that last question. When it comes to equipment and whatnot, it, it does get tough. And so we keep our, our employees on that equipment. You know, running it and whatnot, and we do have a way of bringing back some folks, a lot like our retired operators, to help. And unfortunately, through all a lot of this, and, and that, and the flooding in Little Acres was one of them. We were stretched way thin, way thin, and so there's always room for improvement. Guaranteed, you're right on track with that. And there's there's different things we're trying to look at and see what we can do. Um, so we're working on it. Um, one thing I would say too that we ran into when we requested resources from our county is that um, a lot of this equipment you see in the arts is paid through through streets money. And uh, if you use that equipment for anything other than streets, you get in trouble. So some of the recourse, resource requests we put in, we're told, no, I'm sorry, that's a, that's a, uh, a streets um, uh, piece of equipment and it can't be used for anything else. So let me clarify one thing on that from Gila County, just so we, because I don't want to be lumped in the same deal with the now. But uh, ours are the same way. Everything that sits in that yard has been bought and purchased through HERF dollars, which is the highway user fee tax money. So under normal circumstances, uh, you have your driveway blow out for whatever reason. We can't come in there and fix it because it's private property. You know, what we use that equipment for is mostly like public roads, roads under contract with us to maintain. But there's an exception. And that is, is in the state of emergency, we have the ability to turn around and use that equipment in other places as well. We just have to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted so that we don't jeopardize the, that, that equipment and hearth money. So. Thank you all so much. Um, I just want to say that we're going to work really hard to get these quotes and messages out in local newspapers and local media sources because uh, these were really important messages. And thank you all for taking the time. Can we thank our panelists?